Hello, everybody, and welcome to a new Leaders in Supply Chain podcast. I'm your host, Radu Palamario, and it's my great pleasure to have with us today Colin Breyer. Colin uh, just co-authored the upcoming book, Working Backwards, Inside Stories and Secrets from Inside Amazon, which is a first-person account of how Amazon created and implemented the principles and processes that have made it super successful. Also in the book, you can find stories that created four of the key Amazon businesses, Kindle, Amazon Prime, Prime Video, as well as Amazon Web Services. And a little bit of background about Colin. He's worked for Amazon for around about 12 years in various positions, last one being vice president. He was also he also served two years as technical advisor and kind of chief of staff in, in many ways to Jeff Bezos himself. So he knows Jeff quite well. He also also the COO of IMDB. And, and most recently, he was also the Chief Operations Officer at Singapore-based Red Mart. He also serves as a board member and advisor on different startups as well. So Colin, pleasure to have you and looking forward to the discussion today. Oh, thanks so much for having me. I'm glad to be here. Super. So first and foremost, let's go into how you also start the book, right? And I guess the, the overall book is a, is a great, and I read most of it, it's a, it's a great type of Mem- memoir maybe is not the right word, but the recording of what made or makes Amazon so successful and what is so unique about it. And you start about you start with the chapter on the fourteen leadership principles of Amazon. And fourteen is long is is a lot, right? So maybe tell us a little bit about. Uh, and I think you actually also document uh, how people remember it, right? And and maybe let's let's talk about the best or the most important for you from from those fourteen leadership principles. Okay, it started in the early 2000s. So Amazon obviously has and still is growing very fast. But when it was a much younger company, there were lots of first time managers and first time directors, you know, people managing managers. And uh, we decided that we needed to get some formal Amazon leadership training in in place. We had some, we already had some in place, but um, we just really wanted to bolster up, especially the the new first time managers and and, and directors. And so Mike George, who was the VP, the head of HR at the time, had tasked Robin Andrulovich to go create that class. And Robin said, well, hey, before I can teach the leadership principles at Amazon, we need to really write down what they are and, and agree on that. And Mike you know, rolled his eyes because we wanted to get this training out. Robin was persistent, thank goodness. And Mike said, okay, but, you know, let, let's go do it and let's, let's do it fast. That process thought we thought was going to take, you know, one to two months. It took the better part of a year. But the way that those leadership principles were, I don't want to say created, it was more they were discovered, is Robin, she, she did something really smart. She we took a, a poll of the, the best leaders and most effective people in the company and just started interviewing them and asking them what made them effective at their jobs and then asked other people, you know, why is this leader successful? And we came up with an initial draft. And what impressed me about it was how much time Jeff and not only Jeff, but also Jeff Bezos, the S team, which is essentially Jeff's direct report. So the top leaders of the company took a look at that list and you know Jeff, and then the CEO, CFO Tom Skutak in particular, really scrubbed that list over and over again. We threw out principles, we added some in. We didn't really know what the right number was supposed to be, and so fast forward a year later, we ended up with ten of them. So they're fourteen now, but they're ten. So I mean, one important lesson is if you start on this journey, you don't have, that's not the end of it. You know, as the company evolves, you can actually tweak your leadership principles. And so that, that's, how, that's how, how they started. And we also wanted to make them not a poster on the wall, like a lot of companies have, you know, you'll see it in the elevator when you walk in and then, or you see it on your first day on the job at training, and then you kind of forget about it. And so the, the second thing that we did is once we had those, we wove those into every important process at the company, hiring, how you evaluate people, how you measure uh, different initiatives. So just really any important thing that we we do, those leadership principles are self-reinforcing. And then the last thing we did is, you you can have them, people read them, they can understand them, they can want to aspire to them, but you also need, that's not enough. You know, there's a saying at Amazon that good intentions don't work. 
mechanisms do. And the reason why good intentions don't work is because usually, you know, almost always people already have going, have good intentions going into a situation. So to say, try harder or do better, they're already trying pretty hard, darn hard. And then they're, they're trying, you know, and they're trying to be the best they can. So what you need to do is you need to put in mechanisms or processes to help them and help and also help reinforce the leadership principles. So that's um, you know how, how they how they started out and, and evolved and they're really you know Amazon's living breathing constitution and you, know, you talk to any Amazonian they'll be able to you know notice when what they're not being followed or or when they are being followed you know up and down the the whole org chart. Yeah, because that's I mean and and I think you also wrote about it and. Uh, for me as an outsider, right? When you say 14, it's like, wow, that seems that sounds like a lot. And obviously customer obsession is there is number one. And and that's, I guess, a lot of people, if not everybody knows that that's, that's defining about, you know, about the culture of Amazon. But I guess the key and where, where you kind of get the crux, whether it works or not, is if people leave it, right? And if you leave it, then it's not a memorizing game. It's more of a, well, this is how we do things around here type of a game. And I, I just want to, go a little bit further so 14 are there certain you know is there such a thing as certain more important than others is it you know and i just want to go a little bit in the in, you know are there certain that made a more impact for you personally or or is it all equally important well i mean that you are expected to know and follow all 14 of them they're not numbered they're not prioritized you know customer obsession is at the top you know and amazon is all about customer obsession but you don't get a free pass for saying, well, I didn't follow number 12. You know, they're, they're, they are equally important. Some, some come up more often than others in, in different roles, but you know, they're deliberate, there's, de the, you know, customer obsession and ownership are listed at the top. They, they've been there for a while, but other than that, I would not say that there's a primary set of leadership principles and a secondary. It's really how, how you would go about figuring out how many leadership principles or core values, you know, those are kind of similar terms that other companies use, how many you need. The, you know, the way that we looked at it is what is the minimum set of principles that you want your leaders to follow when faced with making tough decisions when you're not in the room. And you know, so if you just have one or two, that's probably not enough because, you know, you, you, businesses are complicated. You do more, you know, you have to hire people, you have to manage people, you have to build products, deliver them, measure them. And so you want to have what is a sufficient set of leadership principles. It, it's just meant to help the employees at the company and it defines who you are. So, yeah, there isn't one, there isn't a set of them that jump out above the rest. Mm -hmm. You know, makes, makes sense. Moving, moving to the, um piece on hiring, right? And and I, I do remember vividly this expression of, you know, new people were hiring new people who were hiring new people, or something like that, because of the, and it probably still happens because of the, you know, Amazon is still growing, maybe not as exponentially, but it's still growing tremendously. Tell us a little bit or walk us through the process of hiring at, at Amazon. Um, how was it done? I think there's also a story there of how that was iterated, obviously, from, you know, from the days when you were there at the beginning to, to where it is today. Yeah, so you know how it started. It was it was actually a a process developed to address a specific problem, and it was exactly what you said: new people hiring, new people hiring, new people. And with a small company, that is a very risky proposition if you don't have a deliberate hiring process where you know exactly what you're looking for and you have a consistent process on how you vet for those skills, qualities, talents, you know, whatever of the people that you're looking for, because you're going to have people that are, have only been at the company for a couple of weeks or a couple of months making hiring decisions. And, you know, it was pretty apparent that that happened at Amazon before we had this deliberate hiring process. And it, you know, get, it gets back to the good intentions don't work. You know, some people at, you know, at companies would say, hey, you didn't make a great hire, but you've got to make sure that you follow, you know, hire better. That doesn't work. So what Amazon did, and it was really Rick Dalzell, who was the CIO at the time, and, and Joel Spiegel, who was ran the other half of the technology department, just put in a very, and then John Blastelica, the, you know, those three put in a very 
deliberate hiring process called the bar raiser process. And in one way in which it reinforces the leadership principles is that each person on the interview loop gets, you know, one or two or three leadership principles that they're supposed to vet for the candidate coming in and they know what they're looking for. They know, so dive deep, for instance, is a leadership principle, you know, going into the details. They have questions and they're usually behavioral questions about asking what happened in your prior career. Tell me about a time when you had to go roll up your sleeves and really go analyze the data or go deep in a situation and you learn something new from that. And, you know, and that you repeat that for all of the leadership principles. And so what that did is it ensured that as the company grew, that it had the, you know, no matter who hired, that it did have some consistency. And, you know, hiring is, is it is an inherently risky process because you have a couple of hours to project how someone's going to perform over five plus years so that, you know, that is a hard thing to do in itself. So you want to stack the odds in your favor that you're getting the people that you hire are the people that you, you're pretty sure that you want. So let's, and, and actually our business, part of our business is executive search and headhunting. So let's, let's double click a little bit. What are some of the process? What, what, you know, you talked about, you know, the systems almost like you're having the procedure of hiring, right? So what is Amazon doing that consistently or, you know, so um, a couple of things embedded in the bar raiser process are, you know, going into an interview, every interviewer has a specific set of things that they're supposed to go figure out. They know that going into the interview, they know, you know, usually know that the, the questions that they're at least going to start with to try to, to get that information from, from the candidate. And then what they're supposed to do during that interview, you know, you, you take notes, but after, actually after the interview, they, they write down their feedback and they have to come up with an independent assessment and vote, on, right? You know, then in there, hey, knowing what I know now, would I hire this person? And by definition, this process, they only have incomplete information. So you want to amalgamate that with all of the interviewers, but another key part of the bar raiser process, it, re, it tries to remove bias by, you can't tell the next person who, you know, that the candidate is going to interview, I just interviewed this person, they're great. You know, you're going to love them. I mean, that just throws a whole lot of bias in, 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 into the process. And, or if you, you know, before you can place your vote, you can't read anyone else's feedback either. You know, if you're on the fence and then what that does is if you're on the fence, it forces you to really think clearly because you're going to have to defend your decision in what the next phase is, is called the debrief in front of your, your peers. Whereas if you thought this person was, let's say a, a no hire, but you saw the votes that the five people before all said higher, you may think, well, did I really get it right? And you don't want, you know, and they're questioning their, their judgment. That's why you want to put your feedback and vote in before you find out anything else. So it tries to remove, remove bias. And then the last part of it, it, well, there are two parts in the debrief. You have to go, that, that's when you see all the information, you have a discussion about it and there's a role. So it's the bar raiser interviewing process, but there's also a specific person on every interview loop called a bar raiser. They're trained in the process and their job really is essentially to train all of the other interviewers and make sure that the process goes according to, to plan. And they're not in the, the, hire, the hiring chain. So they don't, they don't have a, a bias or a, you know, urgency bias is another bias that can creep in. We have to hire two people this month because we're, or we won't hit our project. They don't really care. They just wanna make sure the hiring process as it should that people really are trying to vet whether this candidate you know, meets, meets the bar. And they also have uh, one thing that's unusual, they have veto power over, they can veto to say, we're not gonna hire this person, full stop. Doesn't really matter who's on the interview loop, the, you know, the hiring manager, a VP, an SVP if they're on the interview loop. If the bar raiser says, no, we're not gonna hire this person, the person doesn't make it pass. Now, in reality, the, there are very few vetoes that get issued because a good bar raiser will, their job is to help the hiring manager hire the right people. So if it's not the right person, you know, just issuing a veto and not saying anything doesn't really help, uh, especially for the next set of interviewers, uh, interviews. So what they do is they're coaching all of the interviewers through that process. You know, why, why are you trying to, to hire? And if, if the, he or she senses biases, urgency bias, 
or um, you know, hey, this person is just like everyone else in the group creep in. Their their job is to point that out and to you know to point out why you probably want to think about it in our, in in a different way. So the vetoes rarely get get issued, but having that veto power is also a unique attribute to the bar raiser process. So I would say those are some specific mechanisms built into the hiring process that are a bit unusual and. There's a feedback loop. This the debrief actually has a feedback loop because as you go through interviews, you get to see everyone else's interviewing style. You get to see what questions they asked, how they how they went to think, you know, to suss out thinking big is another uh, Amazon leadership principle. What questions did they use to get thinking big, and you know, how did they figure out whether this person is a, a long term thinker or not? You know, all the interview loops I've participated in. I've either learned a lot from the other interviewers, taught inter, you know, interviewers, or usually both. And, and so it makes me a better interviewer going into the next one. So it's a simple lightweight process. And where it's where I think it shines is that it's repeatable. It doesn't depend on one individual or a certain set of skills. It's also teachable. You know, the, 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 how you can interview and ask these types of questions, it's not rocket science. So, you know, it's, it's so anyone who wants to can actually go do it. And then this feedback loop, it, it gets better the more time the, the more times the process is run. So those are some at the next level of detail, some unique things that I think have made the bar raiser process one of uh, Amazon's most valuable internal mechanisms or processes to, to grow big while staying true to their roots. Mm -hmm. No, absolutely. And I, I encourage everybody to, to read that because you, you give quite a few examples in the, in the, in the book and that bias is very strong. Uh, I mean, obviously if you hear five people saying yes, and you know, you're the, the one that's kind of sitting on the fence, the likelihood is 99.99% that you're going to say yes as well. So ensuring that that doesn't happen and that everybody kind of expresses in the most objective possible way is key. Um, I, I want to move on to the next chapter, which is one of my favorites or was one of my favorites really. It, it was, well, the title was single threaded leadership, organizing separate single threaded leadership, but, but, but it is more, and I, I want to read a little bit this paragraph that struck a chord with me. Speed or more accurately velocity, which measures both speed and direction, matters in business. With all other things being equal, the organization that moves faster will, will innovate more simply because it will be able to conduct a high number of experiments per unit of time. So I want to kind of combining these two, right, talking about how Amazon uses this, this single threaded leadership with the ability to be to have that speed and velocity that it gives. I wanted, you know, maybe you to share some examples and also some thoughts around how this came about as a, almost like a cultural Sure, sure. So this was this was a problem that Amazon had, had been it had faced for years, and it was growing and it was getting worse as the company grew. Both the technology infrastructure and the way the organiz organization, the way decisions were made in the organization, were actually slowing us down. The the, the more people we added, and and realized that you know if you double or triple the the number of people it's going to take longer and longer to to do projects they're going to get more expensive and so it re really required a, a couple of um heavy lifting projects to do in order to get to this next phase phase which is you know separable largely separable independent teams first of all you had to untangle the whole technology stack that we had and that you know that that's can be tricky to do when you're growing, you know, 20, 30, 50, 100 percent year year over year, and you're doing a lot just to keep the lights on and trying to scale the, the business. And so there was that technology problem that you know, solved by moving largely to a services-based architecture, which you know they're fairly common in, in today's parlance, but you know, back in the you know late 90s, early 2000s, there are a lot of things that were we were trying to invent and to how to tease apart this big system that Amazon had. It was, you know, it was a single code base, especially for for the website. So breaking that apart took a lot of time. And then also how decisions were made in the organization. Whereas if you had a good idea or you wanted to work with the team, you usually had to go up the chain, 
get your convince your manager. Then they had to go over to either beg, borrow, or steal resources from another organization. And we realized we were spending more and more time coordinating and communicating versus actually building and getting stuff done for customers. And so what we wanted to do, um, and you know, you can take the, there's a fork in the road. You can say. Okay, we'll build more internal collaboration tools to simplify communication and coordination. Or you can take the what was the road less traveled at the time to say, we want to just eliminate or reduce all of this coordination and communication between teams because we don't see it adding much value at all. So what does an organization look like where you can have small teams in control of their own destiny, both from a business and technical perspective, moving as fast as a small company would and, you know, so, so have lots of independent teams moving. So that, you know, we, so merging those technology and organization changes, we did that. The first attempt was called a two pizza team. And, you know, the, it's called two pizza teams because if more than two pizzas to feed the whole team at the table, it's probably too big of a team. And so there was a lot of emphasis on the, the team size and then also isolating, you know, building APIs, application programming interface layers between yourself and other teams. So you weren't dependent on other teams to get stuff done. And what we realized is there, what was more important was a single threaded leader. And that is, you know, essential and a single threaded team, just a leader in a team who wake up every day thinking about one, you know, customer product feature or set of, of features. And, you know, that was really, really powerful in that, especially where you're, you have areas where, you know, something can touch a bunch of different, different features in, on the website. You know, if something touches the fulfillment center, the website and customer service, how do you get that project done? Well, unless you have a single threaded leader who actually owns the, the whole thing, it's probably going to take a lot longer to get done. And a great example of that is a product that's out there now called Fulfillment by Amazon. That's right in the middle of a lot of things. You know, it's on the website. There's third-party sellers. There's a whole bunch of uh, physical logistics in the in in the fulfillment centers. It's basically where third-party sellers can store their inventory and use Amazon's logistics infrastructure almost as a peripheral to say, "I want to store it," and then when things are then they can take advantage of things like Prime shipping, gift wrapping, just as if it were an Amazon-owned product. Really hard to do, and it touched uh, you know almost every area of the company, quite honestly. And it was a great idea, but we realized it was not making any traction. And I was almost two years into it, and you know had the the project name that changed over time, and a new person would come in. And it wasn't until Tom Taylor, the VP at Amazon, he's now an SVP, said he was assigned, okay, you're going to own FBA. This is all you're going to do. You have no other responsibility and you're going to get a team and, and you're going to get that done. And that, is, that was a dramatic change in that because uh, there's Dave Limp, who's the, right now the SVP of devices. He has a great quote that says, the best way to, to fail at inventing something is to make it someone's part-time job. And which is true, because if you have a bunch of other things and, you know, fulfillment by Amazon, the revenue was zero at that point. So Tom Taylor had a lot of other things he needed to do before he was the sole owner. But if it's big enough to matter, it should have a senior leader who's that's their sole responsibility, who has the appropriate skills and resources to get it done. Super. No, that's this is a, this is a. This is a brilliant example, and I was uh, exactly I was reading that quote that you just mentioned. With if you want something to fail, make it somebody's part-time, a part-time job because it's so prevalent even in today's you know in today's corporations where you know you're scrambling around but you're not really focused, and that also leads to bureaucracy. So I love this example with having one, you know, one single responsible and owner for for things because then you know obviously the blame but also the credit goes to that person and it, it helps uh, speed things up specifically also with for... customer session too where that's you know you're focused on who are my fulfillment by amazon customers what do i need to put into this or you know and the team what features do i need to put in this program to to make it delight my customers so they're you know focused and obsessed over their their particular customer set mm. And, and, and I guess another characteristic of, uh, of Amazon is the amount of projects that, that they start 
and also, I mean, there's a fair amount of them that fail, right? So that those iterations happen fast and some, you know, some fail and are left behind some, some work out. So maybe, and I, what I've noticed, and, and you deal with a lot of startups, and I guess in corporations, that's one of the biggest problems that corporations face for innovation, that they're afraid of failure, that most employees in the corporation are not actually encouraged or incentivized to fail. They, you know, you want to succeed. So maybe let's talk about some of the failures at Amazon, right? Things that, you know, that you saw, they didn't quite pick up, why didn't pick up, and maybe what did it lead to down the line that actually worked out because of those failures? Yeah, so, sure. So if you really truly want to invent, you have to be okay with failing a certain percentage of the time. And it, you know, it's not, that shouldn't be a career breaker, you know, that, that type of, of failure. If, if you go in with the, you know, the right intentions and, and process and try something and it doesn't work out, you know, it, as um, Jeff has said a couple of times, it's not an experiment. If you know, going into it, that it's going to work. So, you know, if you want to invent, you do have to accept uh, a failure. You know, one obvious example would be the Fire Phone. And that, you know, that was a large project at, at the time for, for Amazon. And so, you know, getting a, a form factor and a phone device that people would use on Amazon, all sorts of uh, reasons why it could help both Amazon customers and be accretive to the whole Amazon ecosystem. And you know, some hadn't try to to try to come up with a unique set of features, a compelling set of features that customers would actually want to buy the phone. You know, predicting consumer behavior beforehand it also is a risky effort that is hard to do, and it it, it won't work some of the time. But you know, it's a very large project, and Amazon launched it, and you know, shortly thereafter, it was pretty clear. You know, based on the the sales, the reception, the customer feedback, and 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 sales are really just another proxy for you know, do customers really, really want that? And, and what they're saying about it, it was, you know, pretty clear that project, the product just didn't fit it and, and, you know, have, occurs how we thought it would. But there were a lot of things in that project. So, you know, two things, there are a lot of things in that project that ended up being put into other, other products that were successful. So the Fire Phone had a lot of voice recognition features built into it that were developed specifically for the Fire Phone. And guess what? They're now in the Amazon and Alexa devices. And so, you know, some of those things were uh, Amazon was able to move over and, 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 you know, there's a lot of hard work and, and, you know, great research, talent and products to develop behind the scenes for that. So that, you know, that's one thing that came out of that. And then the, the you know, the, the people who ran the project, it was not a, a career ender for, for, for them. And, you know, if you notice most of the press about, well, what happened with Fire Phone, a lot of it was Jeff taking, you know, blame and credit for, yes, the Fire Phone, we failed. And he said, I hope we make even bigger failures in the future. You know, we're, hopefully we're working on even bigger failures because if we're not, we're not stretching and pushing the boundary enough. And, you know, so to, to Jeff's credit, he didn't point the finger or say, you know, how did this disaster project happen? You know, because it wasn't a disaster project. It was just an experiment that did not, it, it didn't meet its goals, but, you know, some experiments do, some don't. Mm -hmm. Great example. Talking about metrics a little bit, Colin, and that's, that's the last chapter, I'm jumping a little bit, but you, you talk about metrics, manage your inputs, not your outputs. And that's, that's quite a, you know, flip side almost. So maybe tell us a little bit about that particular. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, you know, Amazon with, with the help of uh, Jim Collins, you know, so the tip of the hat to him with his book, uh, Good to Great, he's, you know, has a, a, a flywheel analogy. We wanted to figure out, well, what actually, you know, what are the things that drive Amazon's business and make it successful? You know, you see, I, I've seen a lot of leaders, CEOs, or, you know, you know, pound their fist on the table. We have to hit our revenue goal for the month or the quarter, or, you know, we've got two weeks left and, you know, the first question is usually when that happens is, well, how? Because there are a bunch of things that you can do that some of them are maybe good for the business. Some of them probably aren't good, you know, short term or long term. So what Amazon does is they they do look at and, and care about the output metrics, which, you know, are lagging indicators, you know, like revenue, free cash flow. But you can't really go to an employee and say, 
I want you to develop, generate more free cash flow next quarter for the company. That's it's it's a hard thing to do, and so Amazon focuses on what what they call controllable input metrics, and those are the the set of activities on that you can control. That if you do those in the right way, they will yield the desired result in your output metrics. And so, if you were to go into a weekly business review for the retail you know, e-commerce business at Amazon. You would see revenue, but the bulk of the metrics would be have a couple of attributes. One is they would be really met, most of them measure the the actual customer experience. How long did it take customers to get the click to order? How long? How many customers complained? You know, contacts per order. How many promises did Amazon miss? And you know, what are the error rates? And so it they and then the second characteristic is they're almost all most of them are input metrics. So they're, they're things like, what is the cost structure compared this week compared to last week? Because the more we lower our cost structure, the more we can afford to lower our prices. How many new products did we add to the catalog last week you know, ver- versus the week prior? Because selection is another input metric. The more stuff you have to offer for sale that's in stock and available to ship, Amazon Prime, the, you know, the more likely customers will be to buy it. And then, you know, you know, convenience, which a lot of that is delivery speed and, and, and you know, how many, what is the average time it takes to get customers their, their order? So you, they focus on that. And so that's an example just for the retail business, but that happens at all levels of, of the org chart at, at Amazon. So Amazon has, I mentioned earlier that the S team are basically the senior leaders of the company. Most of them are Jeff's direct reports, most, but not all, but it's the senior leadership team at Amazon. And each year with the annual planning, there's a set of goals that the company wants to hit. And those are S team goals. I think in, it was 2010, I believe there were 452 of these S team goals and they're they're reviewed by the S team and, and tracked and you know measured on on a rolling basis and um, the vast majority of them are input metrics revenue is only mentioned a few times when you if you were to read down through all, all, all of those goals but they and 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 also most of them measure are direct measures of what how what was the customer experience like on Amazon for this feature, you know, last week, last month, or you know, how many new products did we add to the catalog? So, you know, I've gotten the question. Yeah, all these input metrics are all well and good, but revenue is what counts. So, at what level in the org does does it switch over to? I'm looking just at revenue and and and, and gross profit, you know, gross margin. It do, it doesn't. You know, Amazon fully believes that that the input metrics drive the output metrics. And again, it's not that Amazon doesn't care about free cash flow and revenue. You can look at that just by the results. They just know that if you put most of the focus on input metrics, the rest will work out. If you have the right link and you've identified the right input metrics to drive those output metrics. And that last part is also harder than it sounds. For whatever business you have, you have to say, well, what are the things I'm going to measure and ask people to drive, you know, either up into the right or down and uh, or down into the right, depending on what type of metric it is. You need to make sure that those things will, if your team does those things, that you're actually going to yield the direct result, the, the output results that you want. And that that's took some trial and error. And you know, you can have a metric that's too you know, composite metric that you, where people can do different things and kind of game the number, or you can have a metric that doesn't actually drive the, the, you know, the behavior, the exact behavior that you want. And a simple example for that one would be selection. So how many products are in the catalog? If you just tell the, the category teams, you know, the product team to say, go add more products to the catalog, and by the way, you're going to get measured on that. And we're going to talk about it every quarter. And, you know, Jeff and the S team are going to look at that. Well, you're going to get a lot of products, whether they're the products customers buy or not, doesn't matter how expensive it, it is to get those products and stock them, doesn't matter. So Amazon had went through a couple of iterations to get to what is the right selection metric. And, it, you know, you want to weight it by somehow uh, demand. And in this case, Amazon ended up weighting by page view demand. So you want products that customers look at, but that also are in stock 
and can be delivered to customers through Amazon Prime is how that turned, you know, the metric evolved over time. And that is a learning experience. So that, you know, getting this right, it takes several iterations and then and then you operate according to those metrics. Yeah, so it's, it sounds to me like, you know, as long as it's again from a very simplistic principle perspective, make sure the client is happy. Do the do the right actions to keep the client happy, and then you know the results will follow automatically. If I am to simplify it, rather than you know looking at this fluffy, okay, we need to hit a billion, a million, a ten billion, and then like okay, but you know what specifically do I as a you know I don't know fulfillment center or customer experience manager or whatever have to do, and and. Let, let me bring it now to the working backwards chapter, right? Which is also the title of the book, but you have a chapter, right? Start with the, the desired customer experience. So tell us a little bit about, about that and how Amazon thinks about, well, customer experience and, and did, well, I guess, designing the product to fulfill that, right? Yeah. So, you know, one way that some companies build products are using a skilled forward type approach to say, for our company, what are we good at? What are our competitors doing? What's the market opportunity? If we can move into a new market and get X percentage, here's what it looks like. Um, and you know, do we have the skills in order to go build this or do that? I mean, that's one way to build products. You know, given where Amazon was at when uh, actually had to invent or create a lot of things, if you use that skilled forward approach, you wouldn't. Some of these things that are household names would never be developed. Like Kindle is a great example. You know, when, when Amazon, when we were deciding we want to go into digital um, books, throughout that whole process, we decided, well, you need a device and a device is a key area of differentiation. So, you, you know, in that, when you want to differentiate, you typically want control over that and but to build an expertise in that. So we decided, well, we need to be a device maker. And we hadn't built a single device. There weren't too many people at the company, if any, that knew how to do that. But we realized if we want to move into eBooks and be successful, this is what we have to do. So that's a, a big difference from a skills forward uh, approach. But so at Amazon, the working backwards process, it's really all about putting the customer front and center from very beginning of the project and then working backwards from, from that point. So that's what the process is about in the tool that Amazon uses. And this is used for every new feature product or, you know, large or small. It could be something as small as a feature on, on a, you know, an app. Or do we want to move into this geography? You know, what, what should be the next country that we move into, you know, Amazon moves into or get into a new business altogether? So the tool that Amazon uses is it's a PRFAQ, which is short for press release and uh, frequently asked questions. And so the first person, the first thing that, that any team has to do is they've got to write a press release, which is, you know, a one page press release explaining in very simple terms, kind of the elevator pitch, what this product is about and explain it to the customer. And if you read that press, it's not the actual press release that goes out if the product gets built, usually is not. But if you read that press release and you're not excited to buy or use that feature, you know, you do, you go back and write another one and another one until you either realize that there's yes, there's a great idea here, or you know, it was a, it was a good idea, but it's just not worth doing. And then the second part of the the PRFAQ is the frequently asked questions, and what that is meant to do. There are two types of questions: are internal facts and external facts. The external ones are things that you, if you're typically explain this to customers, what is the product about? How much is it going to cost? Why would I buy this product versus product X from a competitor that's already out there? Or, you know, to the press, you know, things that you would say about the product. The internal fact, it's a list of all the questions and tough issues that you haven't figured out, but you have to, or that here, here's what makes this project hard, you know, can we build this thing for this device with a $200 bill of materials or less to offer it at the price point of $250 or you know, $299? How are we going to get this product to market? We don't have a direct sales force. So are we going to partner with someone or do we have to build a sales force? So you ask those questions and it's a really lightweight technique for addressing the hard issues up front. And you know, it's the same thing with the press releases. The team who, who reviews that PRFAQ document, it's an iterative process. If you if you know the, the senior leaders or who's ever reviewing it, 
if something's missing, they'll say, well, you didn't address this. Can you go back and, and do another iteration? And so most of these products or features go through several iterations until they get the green light to go ahead or that no, we're just, it's not the right time to do this, this project. Mm -hmm. And uh, most, I would say, you know, a good chunk of ideas and, and I never make it through and get, get greenlit, but that's okay because that is a relatively lightweight way. You know, you're writing press releases and frequently asked questions and, and, and you're, you're doing a lot of research and digging to, you know, do we have the technology to do this? Is AI developed enough to solve this problem if it's the right way to, you know, to solve it? So, you know, it's not just writing and answering. You have to go do a little bit of research in these iterations. But front and center, you know, is the customer in the working backwards process. And that, that is really what, it, what it's all about. Mm, doing good. Uh, research and, uh, and writing press releases is a, is a heck of a lot less time spent rather than starting to build something and figuring out quarter of the way or halfway that actually it was a bad idea. So uh, yeah. to the point that you also make in the book that sometimes the, and it happens to me a lot in my personal life and maybe to others as well, right? When you're in a rush and when you like have that pressure of emergency, okay, I need to hire somebody, I need to do something quickly, I need to, you don't think through all the different elements and sometimes the solution is much easier than, than what you think it is and because you press for time. So uh, very good and practical. I mean, it's not, it's not rocket science really, but we just forget the common And that's sense. a case where sometimes slowing down at that stage actually gets you to your end goal faster and cheaper than is if you were to rush ahead. And, you know, if you build something that misses the mark because you just didn't do your homework up front. That's that's an execution error. If you build something and you you know you think customers will be receptive to it, and for some you know reason that you know that consumer behavior doesn't is not adopted, that's a different class of error and a failure. That's sometimes it's going to happen because of the, the risk involved in launching new products. So mm -hmm. you know these classes of of errors are different. So Amazon tries to avoid that first class that I mentioned by using the work working backwards process. Mm -hmm. Well, Colin, I want to thank you for all the great examples. I want to encourage people to look up Colin's book, Working Backwards, a lot more gems, a lot more stories, a lot more case studies and example in there and very insightful. And well, if we can't learn from Amazon, then I don't know who we can learn from because what, what they have built is just impressive and incredible and they continue to do it. Thanks a lot for the time, Colin, and, and keep, uh, you know, keep sharing and hopefully inspiring some more people to build the next Amazon and the next Amazon and the next Amazon. Oh, you're welcome. Thanks so much for having me on the show. My pleasure. Thank you for listening to our podcast. If you like what you heard, be sure to go to www.elcotglobal.com and click the podcast button for all the show notes of the interview. Also, subscribe to our mailing list to get our latest updates first. If you're listening through a streaming platform like iTunes, Spotify or Stitcher, we would appreciate a kind review. Five star works best to keep us going and our production team happy. And of course, share it with your friends. I'm most active on LinkedIn, so do feel free to follow me. And if you have any suggestions on what, what to do and who to invite next, don't hesitate to drop me a note. And if you're looking to hire top executives in supply chain or transform your business, of course, contact us as well to find out how we can help.